Welcome to our newest podcast at the Florida Squeeze, Squeezing the Season, which is going to be an election-related podcast uh, for 2024. I'm joined by my co-host, Ryan Ray, who is the chair of the Leon County Democratic Party. Uh, and we have a very special guest for our first podcast, Fernanda Mondi of, of uh, Ben Dixon and Amandi, and uh, maybe more prominently now, more famously, an MSNBC contributor. So, Fernand, thank you for joining us. Hey, Cardick, it's my pleasure to be here on the, the squeezing of the season with you here on the Florida Squeeze. And uh, Ryan, why don't you say hello to the audience for those who might not know you and, and, and talk a little bit about what's going on uh, up in Tallahassee. Really, really good uh, to be with you both today. Um, a very, very interesting and engaging time in Florida's politics and nationally, so glad to break it down with you guys uh, from a perspective of elected Democratic uh, Party chair here and uh, just a longtime participant in this process, so thanks a ton. So, Fernand, the first uh, uh, question I want to ask, and I think maybe this will be the broad overview of what's happened, uh, we have seen a decline in the vote share among Latino voters or Hispanic voters in Florida in every election since 2016. Peaks in 2016, 2018, you see significant bleed. 2020, um, it gets worse. Uh, and 2022, Democrats are decimated among Latinos in Florida. And um, contrary to the narrative that's out there from activists and a lot of people who read uh, our site and listen to our our, our, our audio content, um, it is not just among Cubans, Cuban Americans and Venezuelan Americans. It is a uh, universal thing, unfortunately, among most Hispanic groups, including Puerto Ricans and Mexican Americans, you know, very democratic, uh, historically rock rib democratic um, Latino groups. So, Fernand, walk us through what's happened in Florida and why it's happened. Well, Cardiff, uh, you put your finger on it. You know, this is a sad and very frustrating story if you're a Democrat or a voter that just wants to see the Democrats do better here in the Sunshine State because it was indeed the Hispanic vote around the turn of this 21st century and its growth and its shifting nature, which is what positioned Florida to be, again, a swing state. Barack Obama in 2008 and definitively again in 2012 wins the state both times because of how the Hispanic vote started shifting in the direction of supporting Democrats. Uh, yes, some Cubans, a lot of Cubans started to change their voting patterns from having been a monolithically Republican vote over the decades to now being more open to voting for Democrats, but also powered by the growth of the Puerto Rican vote, which is overwhelmingly Democratic. And then changes and shifts amongst Colombians, Nicaraguans, uh, Venezuelans, as they started to assert themselves more in Florida's electorate, we saw them coming back in bigger numbers for the Democrats, and that's what made Florida, again, the nation's premier swing state and helped Obama eke out that re-elect victory in 2012 and, and win rather comfortably by Florida standards in, in 2008. And really, what also kept Hillary Clinton so competitive in that 2016 election, which I think she lost, the margin was by what, around 110, 120,000 votes to Trump. We thought she was actually going to win the state at first because of how dominant she was with Hispanics throughout the state, particularly in South Florida, which gave her a huge advantage going in, only to see later North Florida and the white vote really come the other way against her and, and lose to the state in the process. But really, it's been sad because it's not so much that there's been an attitude shift, in my judgment, Cardick, it's been more just an abandonment of the playing field by the Democrats when it comes to the Hispanic vote here in Florida and being out hustled by the Republicans who saw the panic of what happened in 2012 and, and, and just went on a DEFCON one with putting all efforts to try and win back the Hispanic vote for them in Florida, and they did that. Well, yeah, no, I, I just totally agree with Fernand's um, uh, diagnosis there. I think that uh, you've seen a lot less. Uh, I think that the Democrats losing uh, more than Republicans winning has been the story there. They've made huge investments. Uh, the Democrats have uh, kind of been in, in shambles, uh, not building cycle after cycle. The same old story with other electorates, um, exurban. Uh, in suburban populations that we've talked about over the years, Kardec, um, uh, just just honestly kind of uh, 
atrophying from neglect from the party. Um, so yeah, I'm very, very much on the same page. You know, as someone who uh, was a, a part of that 2012 re-election effort, you know, just as a humble field organizer in Tampa area, um, I haven't seen that level of organization since then, probably. And uh, there's no doubt that the Hispanic electorate is less engaged because of it. What's your sense, Fernand, on um, the prospects of the Democrats maybe uh, taking advantage of um, Latinos and Hispanics moving into areas uh, where uh, they – because this is a theory I've heard for years, that um, even among Cuban-Americans and Venezuelan-Americans, as they move away from Dade and Broward County and they move into other parts of the state, um, they may become more democratic. Um, but – I, I, I've actually observed that even in Osceola County, which had turned into a Democratic county because of the Puerto Rican vote, we're beginning to see it go uh, the other direction. And um, in Orange County, uh, some of the weakest precincts for the Democrats, it's a county the Democrats are winning by, by pretty big margins in, in every election. It's one of the few counties Charlie Chris carried against Ron DeSantis. Um, but Orange County, you're seeing the straw, the, the larger the precincts with larger Latino votes, particularly in South Orange County, uh, begin to trend towards the Republicans as well. So maybe that was a, a fallacy that as some of these groups moved away from uh, Southeast Florida and moved into the rest of the state, uh, it would help Democrats. Well, I mean, I think that was certainly true in, in the 90s and in the early part of, of this century. But again, w what happened is, is Florida has now become a Republican red state and you know, that's certainly not news that I, I want to have to admit or, or say out loud, but, you know, facts are facts and the numbers are the numbers. And, and Cardick, this again is coupled by the point that Ryan made. As the Democratic investment in the state has really tailed off these last eight years, remember, there really wasn't what you would call a massive engagement by the Biden campaign during the 2020 cycle, partly because of COVID, partly because they never really were all that invested in Florida as a state that they needed to have, and then they subsequently proved they could win the White House without it. And then the abandonment, uh, just the wholesale abandonment of the state in 2022. So you, you see that, and this Republican pressing, this Republican doubling and quadrupling down, not just on Hispanic voters in Florida, but in every other corner of the state, it really has diluted that otherwise effect of leaving areas in southeast Florida where you might go to other corners of the state and see more parity or acceptance of the Democratic way of thought. Uh, that That's just not happening as much in 2024 uh, or, or over the last six years. What's your sense uh, in terms of the Democrats' recognition of this problem? I mean, do you sense that they – they understand if they're going to make Florida a competitive state again. Um, and as you said, Florida became competitive in the first place, because I don't think a, a lot of our listeners, uh, I, I try and remind them often, but I don't, I don't know if they realize this. In the 1980s, uh, even though it was a Republican era in presidential elections, Florida was actually the most Republican state in the Southeast. It was more Republican percentage-wise than, than Georgia or South Carolina or uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, certainly more than North Carolina, which remained kind of competitive for National Democrats the whole time. Uh, and we're going to get to North Carolina in a few minutes. Um, we're going to shift to talking about North Carolina. But um, that Florida became competitive in the 1990s because of the Hispanic vote. That's the reason it became a state National Democrats could target and potentially win. Obviously, Florida Democrats, traditional Florida Democrats had always done well at the state level in Florida. It was not a competitive state at the national level. Um, so in your discussions and in your work, Fernand, do you feel like there's a recognition now that, OK, if we're ever going to put Florida back in play, whether it's in 26, or 28 or whenever, it's going to have to start with rebuilding among Latinos? Yeah, again, I don't say this with any pleasure or, or, or any feeling of satisfaction, quite the opposite. But no, I mean, I don't see anything that suggests that. And even if you look at what's happening now, you know, we're, we're talking about this in, in, uh, in late September, you know, less than uh, 45 days before the election. And, and, and Democratic hopes are on what has been the Democratic approach over the last several cycles, which is to hopefully see an infusion of money at the end to try and salvage and pull out a victory from from the jaws of defeat uh, i don't see anything by way of statewide infrastructure or any type of real investment or any type of 
operationalized campaign effort to target Hispanics, counter message to Republicans uh, when it comes to Florida Hispanic voters, anything that is a paid media or earned media or surrogacy effort, it's all done on the margins and certainly a, a, sh- a shadow uh, and, and a pale effort compared to what the Republicans have been doing consistently you know, over these past 10 to 12 years. So I, I don't see recognition of that. I think the numbers certainly argue for that, as you say. But is there something that is actually being done uh, for cycles going forward? Are we preparing ourselves right now for 2026, 2028, if 2024 is not successful for Democrats in Florida? And it doesn't look like it's going to be at least as of today. No, I don't see anything like that happening. We see uh, we see a lot of um, volunteer excitement. We are seeing an unusual level of organic um, intensity, I think. Um, and I'm not sure that it's being met with, um, I don't think the energy is being met by, by Democrats, uh, Democratic strategists nationally. I do think that we, uh, uh, there's a, there's a feeling like we are, uh, being, you know, may, maybe being stranded. I, I think that there is a lot of, um, outreach, uh, that's going on. We're, we're seeing a lot of internal commerce of volunteers and that sort of thing, unusual level of um, inquiries and volunteer energy compared to 22 and 20. Um, but whether it's going to be met uh, with with the national investment, we are seeing one thing that we are continually seeing is these kind of head fake moves from the DNC chairman um, and from media surrogates here and there. But like you said, Fernand, it seems to be um, often, um, you know, uh, not, not backed up by, by a serious all-in effort. And uh, so, you know, I, we, we're an incredibly, and especially weak and sputtering Trump campaign is kind of our, uh, the, the hope that we're hanging on to as, as Florida Democrats. I think that's right. I mean, I'm not one that says it's impossible that uh, Kamala Harris can end up carrying Florida's three electoral votes in November. Uh, I do think it's implausible. And what's really interesting is if it somehow does end up happening, the question is, is, is that a blessing for Florida Democrats and, and those interested in the party in Florida, or, or is that almost a curse? Because then the, the argument might be, well, look, we didn't really invest the millions of dollars that we traditionally do in Florida and lose. Well, this time, we didn't really do much, but it was the volunteer spirit and the energy that kind of got us across the finish line. Maybe we can win Florida without working Florida, as had been the past days. I'm not sure that that's exactly a recipe for the future. That said... I think we must be acknowledged, and you're on the money, Ryan, that Florida is a state where there are still, even yes to this day, millions of Democrats that live here. Millions of Democrats who are excited and engaged by the Harris candidacy that have been revitalized since she's taken the nomination over Joe Biden. So there's all of that activist volunteer energy, but the question is, where does it go? How is it channeled? Is is, Is there even an infrastructure in place in Florida that can effectively channel all of that enthusiasm like we saw in the 2008 campaign, like we saw in the 2012 campaign, like we even saw in the 2016 campaign. I'm not sure that that mechanism exists just yet. Let's uh, change our focus to a state that is in play, a state that you've polled uh, uh, extensively, Fernand, and a state you you know really well, um, which is North Carolina. Um, We have seen... Cycle after cycle in North Carolina, the Democrats carry the governorship. Um, we saw it actually both in 16 and 20. Let's just speak specifically of cycles where uh, Trump is on on the ballot, right? 16 and 20, Roy Cooper wins the governorship. Um, and uh, you have some down ballot statewide races that are going uh, Democratic, right? Secretary of State Elaine Marshall, Lieutenant Governor uh, uh, Stein had won. He's now running for governor. Um, but then uh, at the top of the ticket, the Republicans carry the state. Uh, we're seeing signs that um, now that might not happen. Uh, uh, the growth in uh, the, the suburban areas of Charlotte uh, towards uh, the Democrats. And then obviously the triangle area, which has always been fairly reliably Democratic, um, even becoming more so. Yeah, I mean, you know, North Carolina is, is the sleeper state and, and has been on my radar for, for many, many years now, Cardick. And and as you said, you know, their, their record when it comes to presidential performance for Democrats 
is it great over the last 50 years? I think they've only carried the state twice, most recently being uh, Barack Obama. And, and I think it was 2008 was the last time that the state was carried. But there is something happening in North Carolina, just like we saw in 2020, something happening in Georgia, which was years in the making. And, and that's a demographic revolution. And, and a lot of it is driven, ironically enough, by Hispanics and Hispanic voters. When I lived and grew up in the state of North Carolina in the mid to late 80s, there were only 50,000 Hispanics across the entire state today there are in excess of 1.3 million wow in the state of north carolina so wow. it's a, a, a phenomenal it's the fastest growing hispanic electorate in the united states uh because of just massive influx and a lot of those believe it or not are floridians who are hispanic you also have a lot of uh, virginians of hispanic origin and those from california and texas moving to North Carolina, a state that they see as affordable, a state that they see as temperate, a state with a growing economy in different areas, and also now, and at least over the last eight years, a state that is controlled, at least at the governor's mansion, by Democrats, so they're seeing it as an attractive offering, and that's why that state is so close. You mentioned earlier, uh, in 2020, Trump did carry the state, but it was the state that he won with the, with the closest margin of victory less than seventy-five thousand votes is what trump carried in the state of north carolina by in in the year 2022 so uh, i see it not only in play uh it's absolutely in play i actually see harris surprising and shocking a lot of people and it may be the salvation state for democrats when the dust clears and settles on november 5th when one structural difference between um North Carolina and Florida is it's North Carolina's gubernatorial politics takes place on the presidential cycle, um, as opposed to here where it's the midterm. What kind of opportunities are you seeing with the current controversy at the top of the ticket with the North Carolina Republicans? Well, I mean, every opportunity. I, mean, I, I, I think what is making me and a lot of others much more bullish on North Carolina is the fact, I mean, look, I'll tell you right now, Josh Stein is going to win that election going away. The only question is, does Josh Stein win it by 10 points, 15 points, or 20 points? And, and you start talking about that type of a spread, it, it almost becomes impossible to see a scenario where Donald Trump manages to hold on to North Carolina while the Democratic nominee for governor is winning the state by double digits. And, and that's why there is, I think, open panic and an acknowledgement, what happens if Harris carries North Carolina? Well, it means that Pennsylvania becomes the entire ballgame again, and there could be no margin of error, whether it's in Arizona, Georgia, or Nevada. Because if she were to lose those three, lose Pennsylvania, but carry North Carolina, it still might not be enough to, to win the president. So this is my last question, Fernand. I um, have observed a lot of... Uh, and I think we've all observed an exodus of a lot of liberal people from Florida since uh, 2020. Um, and uh, uh, they've been replaced by conservative people moving in from states like Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, which also may make those states more Democratic, right? Those people moving to Florida. The number one destination, at least for the people in my circle, liberals who have left the state, and I'm talking about dozens and dozens of people, has been North Carolina. It has not been New York or California as the MAGA people would, would claim it would be, right? Like they like to say, oh, all the blue state left, leftists are moving to California. No, in fact, in my experience, and again, this is anecdotal evidence. It's just my circle. North Carolina has been the number one destination. So I wanted to ask you if you've seen some of the same movement towards North Carolina, migration towards North Carolina from Florida. And also, if that's the case, how, how does that affect um, election 2024 in North Carolina. Is that kind of that Georgia dynamic in 2020 when uh, it surprised a lot of people uh, uh, how uh, how Georgia went? Is is that one of the dynamics that puts North Carolina in play this well, time? The short answer, Cardick, is uh, hell yes. <laughs> I mean, as I mentioned, you know, not, not only am I seeing that, you know, in the numbers themselves, I mentioned that the largest group of Hispanics that have come to the state in the last five years, they come from the state of Florida. So it's also a phenomenon that you see with non-Hispanics as well. And and look, 
on the anecdotal level, like you, and I don't know if this is Ryan's experience, but I also know literally uh, dozens of people that over the last five to ten years have picked up stakes in Florida and settled in the state of North Carolina. So that's why I, all eyes of the political world that are really looking for what is the emerging state, the next Georgia, if you will, or, or North Carolina for a lot of these reasons. I think we all I think we all daydream about it sometimes. And yes, absolutely, Fernando. A lot of my um, you know, fellow classmates from New College and people I grew up with in Tampa, tons of them, like Cardi said, probably, you know, dozens uh, have moved up there. And a lot of us who have spent summers uh, in western North Carolina and in Florida can can understand why. Well, you know, I've I've had a home up there for the last thirty five years in western North Carolina in the Boone area, so you know, it's tough for me to sometimes justify coming back to Magistan here when, uh, <laughs> when you've got a beautiful Democratic-run state that seems to be firing on all cylinders and it actually affects its residents and, and is using state funds to embolden them. So I think that's that's something very powerful. And uh, I guess uh, we'll, we'll finish on this note, Fernand, unless uh, Ryan has, has something else. Um, uh, the success of North Carolina Democrats at the state level – the fact that the Republicans have held the governorship for just four years this this century, right? Um, and their their elections are the same day as the presidential election. So you have enough ticket splitting there that Democrats continue to hold the governorship and, and will hold it again uh, this time, as, as, as you referenced earlier. Is there anything Florida Democrats can learn from that? Uh, well, 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 oh, oh my God. Go ahead, Carnick. I'm so I'm so happy you addressed this because I wanted to end on on this point that it just so happens to dovetail precisely into the question you're raising. Here's one of the problems of, of Florida, one of the structural problems, and I'd be curious to see if Ryan agrees with my thesis here. I haven't really heard this discussed anywhere else, but as I look at what is one of the other massive and major impediments to why Democrats can't get a freaking foothold in here in our state of Florida. It's precisely the fact that we are, in essence, walled out of state government. Think about it now. We're going on 30 years that the Democrats have not won a governor's race here in Florida. The last time was in 1994 when uh, Lawton Child famously held off the Jeb Bush advance and, and won a second term, was reelected. But that was it. By 1998, that was done. And in this century, the 21st century, the Democrats have never held the governorship in Florida, but what is one of those byproducts of that? The byproduct is there's no patronage. There is no opportunity for Democrats who are work as volunteers or activists that want to serve and gain experience and establish a presence in the state to then work in the many thousands of positions of state government. So the Republicans have weaponized that completely. They will not allow a non-loyalist Republican to have any position of influence or authority or experience in state government. And Democrats have been literally for an entire generation walled off and, and prevented from doing that. And it's at every level, from the cabinet to the governor's race. They have a majority of the congressional districts, which limits the opportunities to serve in local government. Certainly the legislature is a, a super majorities on each side, also limiting patronage opportunities for Demo young Democrats to serve in the legislature or in positions of employment with the state. So those factors have a huge impact. In North Carolina, we don't see that because there has been a traditional Democrat control of the governor's mansion up there. So there are much more opportunities if you're a Democratic activist or worker or operative. You can get, stay in the state and work during the non-campaign cycles and then in your volunteer time and your free time continue to do the political work that needs to be done. We just don't have that in Florida. I t t totally agree. I think that <clears throat> the Adam Street culture up here in Tallahassee is beginning to express itself in exactly that way. You're seeing even it used to be the political appointees at the top with classic civil service uh, employees at the state agencies below that. Now they're weaponizing um, and, and loyalistizing even entry level and mid level jobs in this thing. And so it, I used to think in 2018, you know, if Andrew Gillum won. You know, the three of us would have to suit up and take you – know, nobody even remembers what it's like uh, to, to run a government on the Democratic side. I definitely think that's a big factor. And, of course, the institutional capture. Um, the Republicans are very, very infamously uh, keen to, um, you know, uh, make, make the donor class people very, very uh, uh, cautious about how, they, about how they spend their political contributions. Yeah, just a quick – just trying to your point. I mean, let's just – there's a lot of people listening, I'm sure, who are – 
Democratic operatives or people that would like to maybe work in Democratic politics. Let's assume you work on a, on a campaign for a Democrat, whether it's statewide or a local race, and the campaign is, is then unsuccessful. What do you do afterwards if you want to stay involved? You, you've got to go and get another job, maybe outside of politics, maybe outside of, of public service and public leadership. So it limits your opportunities, not only for your own edification, for your own knowledge, but to stay involved. And as a result, we also have a brain drain. Just like we know anecdotally a lot of Democrats and others and folks who have moved from Florida for personal reasons to North Carolina, a lot of the potential operative class that starts out here, we grow a lot of talent, but we have to export it out through brain drain looking for opportunities because there just aren't any in Florida. And until we start to think about it, maybe from those terms, I don't see it changing. Yeah, I think that's Fernand. It's such a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, I think that the culture here in Tallahassee and Leon County, we are certainly holding it down. Um, I think that uh, you know the, the the state government will continue its uh, its sort of crusade against democratic communities, the way that they've overstepped and overreached into local affairs uh, in, in the Keys and in Gainesville and here as well. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that the culture has a lot of catching up to do. Um, and building out a, uh, a democratic sort of political culture. Um, and yeah, as you said, yes, of course, the patronage network uh, is something that we, in the face of all the defunding, the left activism, tort reform, everything else, that's that weaponization of state government. Uh, I think that um, building the, uh, the, the sinews and the, the, uh, the, the connective tissue uh, between exactly all the talent that we have here uh, is, is, is an urgent priority that uh, we have to face as, as state Democrats. And uh, I think that uh, is, is going to be a, a critical uh, uh, action item going forward. I would just sum it up this way. You know, Florida Democrats, I know they want to win the presidency and they want to carry Florida in the process. All of their efforts should be instead concentrated on winning the governor's election in Florida as opposed to the presidential election. Sure, we'd love to have it. It's nice to have. But it would be much, much more impactful for Florida Democrats, and by extension, Democrats across the country, if Florida were to recapture the governor's mansion, than it would be to have Harris carry Florida now in 2024 and lose the governor's mansion again in 2026. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and the other thing I would add to that is uh, the attorney general's race has been so important in Florida, and I've stressed that for years, that um, uh, that one of the things that the Republicans have been able to really use Florida to do is to pursue lawsuits against Democratic presidents and Democratic administrations because they've held the attorney general's uh, spot in this state since 2002. So that that also, I think, has to be a priority. It's more important than winning uh, the electoral votes for Florida if you win the national election anyway, in spite of Florida, as Biden did in, in 2020. Uh, Fernand, uh, tell our listeners where they can find you online. Uh, uh, besides, I mean, obviously, MSNBC, give a plug for that. People know you from that. But where else they can find your work? You know, I, I hate to say it, Carter, because I'm only, in terms of social media, I'm only on the application formerly known as Twitter. Oh. And, and I don't want to send any new uh, subscribers to the Elon Musk's weaponized uh, outlet. But if you do want to follow me there, you can at Amandi on air on Twitter. It'll always be Twitter to me. <laughs> yes, it will always be Twitter to us. Uh, thank you so much, Fernand, for your time today.